<clears throat> Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Um, I clearly believe that your future of C-sharp is actually in using it with Google Play services. And I'm going to tell you today why your apps all need more Google Play services in them. How many people think that their app needs more Google Play services? It should be everyone. You're all in here to talk about Google Play services. Uh, it's my job to convince you otherwise, I guess. So I did an, an interesting experiment. I took account of the number of methods that exist in the core Android library, right? So the android.jar file. There's quite a few in there. There's over 35,000 methods, according to the dex count, in the core of Android. This is API level 23, then. It was thin out there. So if 35,000 methods is enough content to get us really interested in you know, using those APIs and making our apps with them, then I think 45,000 methods warrants a little bit of attention too, right? You might say there's a lot of meat there. Well, what kind of meat? We've got ads, we've got games, we've got measurement, barcode scanning, wearables, fitness, drive, cloud messaging, app invites, app indexing. There's a lot of meat there. And if you think about those 35,000 methods, that doesn't include any of the boring stuff. This is all good things that aren't you know, activities and fragments and all the things that we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. Another great reason to use Google Play services and why your app needs more of it, fragmentation. Has anyone dealt with fragmentation in their apps before? At least a few people. Well, if you haven't yet and you're new to Android, Google Play services gives us a really nice answer to this. In fact, it works all the way back to API level 9, that's gingerbread, that's uh, Android version 2.3. That's only about 2% of all the devices out there. So we're hitting a lot of devices with Google Play services. And you don't have to tailor your API to know whether or not you're on a certain API level and you can call a certain API in Google Play services. It just works. How do they do this? Well, they did something really clever. They actually ship Google Play services as an app, as an APK file. This goes on your device. And it gets silently updated every time there's a new version. So it's a special kind of app, but it's still just an app. And we use the client library in our own apps to connect to this APK file. Now, I haven't found any actual proof, but from my observations, Google actually does another interesting thing here. They wait until that APK file is almost completely rolled out or to you know, a maximum tipping point of devices before they actually ship the client service part of it out to us developers. That means you can be reasonably confident that when we get this new version with all these new APIs to use, with all this cool stuff, we don't have to worry about it being available on our devices. It's just there. So not only do we not worry so much about API level fragmentation, we also don't worry about the fragmentation of which devices are up to date with that app. Of course, it wouldn't be a set of bindings unless they were brought to you by us, Xamarin. We maintain, we own these bindings. Uh, you can get them on the component store. You can get them on NuGet. Now, I often get asked the question, which, where should I go, component store or NuGet? They're both on both of them? Well, the component store is actually dependent on the NuGets. So if you already know what you want, if you already know the exact APIs that you're going to use in your app, go to NuGet. It's a great place to get binary package management. But if you don't quite know what you want to do, if, if you're still stuck getting going, you want some documentation, you want a getting started guide, you want maybe some samples, the component store is a great place for that. So you can pick the best place for you to go get them. If you're getting them from NuGet, it looks a little something like this, our NuGet package manager. A little while back, Google actually broke off all of the different parts of Play services into separate libraries. So they reached a point where the, the main one library was getting really big. So they decided, let's break it apart into pieces and let developers pick what they want. We've mirrored that intention with our NuGet packaging, and we also have the individual pieces for you to get in your app. So you can pull in exactly what you want. You don't need to pull in everything. If you like to live on the wild side, I highly suggest you check the include pre-releases box, uh, something similar in uh, Xamarin Studio as well, if you're working there. Generally, we try and get updates to Google Play services very quickly after Google gets them. Now, usually these live initially in the pre-release section while our QA team goes through and actually makes sure you know, 
we're shipping some higher quality bindings than maybe we have in the past. We're really working on quality. That's something that we talked about early today in the keynote, right? So if you are so inclined and you see some new features you want to play with, check the pre-release box. You'll usually find something there. Also, as of this morning, all of the things are open source. That's also including Google Play Services. Uh, so you can go to our GitHub page. You can get our Google Play Services components repository, uh, see the source code, see how we do the bindings. Um, you know, don't throw too many tomatoes our way. But they're there for you to look at. And you know, issues, pull requests, it'll be an interesting community project for us going forward. Looking forward to it. So let's dive into some actual content. This is one of my favorite APIs. How many people have used Fuse Location Provider? Anyone? Oh, good. Not that many people. This is one of the maybe more popular ones, um, but I think it's worth looking at because it's really, really good to use. And probably a lot of people uh, have a good use for location in their apps. So Google actually strongly recommends that you use this API over the core Android location APIs now. This does things a lot better. It automatically chooses the best provider for you. So based on the criteria that you pass it, it'll decide, do I need to use the GPS or cell tower triangulation or Wi-Fi it'll, or a mixture of the, those signals? It's really scalable, too. It's really good on battery uh, because it actually is sharing that location data between all of the apps that are using these APIs. So if another app just went out and talked to the GPS radio and got a really accurate fix, and next my app wants to get a, a reading, it doesn't have to go back and communicate with the GPS radio itself. So all of this information is shared between apps, which really helps at scale. We're actually seeing uh, numbers published a while back, and, and I think these are, are pretty old, so it's probably improved since then. The highest accuracy setting was about 7% battery drain per hour, but there's a really great balanced option that we'll see in a minute that lets you drain about 0.6% of the battery per hour and gives you a, a, about a 40 meter accuracy reading. I'm not really sure what that is in feet. You guys will have to Google that. So this is what the request API looks like. It's really, really simple, and we'll dive into it, like I said, in just a second. There's basically two things you have to do to get locations. Uh, but I wanted to focus first on this Google API client thing. So we need this Google API client instance. And if you remember when I was first talking about how they ship the app and the client services libraries, we always have to connect into that app. So this Google API client is our way of doing that. It's a really common pattern in Google Play services. You're going to see it over and over again, except for Maps. So Maps is, is sort of a, a funny one unto itself. Um, it existed a long time before some of the other APIs, and so it sort of does its own thing. We're not going to talk about Maps today. There's a lot of great documentation out there. We want to focus on some of the more interesting stuff. So this Google API client. You used to have to manually manage your connection. Now we have an automatic way to do it. But let's talk about the manual way first. You need to handle the disconnect and connection calls and the right activity lifecycle events. You need to also worry about resolving errors. So I mentioned earlier that we can be reasonably confident that the latest version of Google Play Services is on the devices of our users. And that's mostly true, but it's not always going to be true. So one of the possible cases you'll run into is that the API, or sorry, the Google uh, Services Library, the app itself is out of date. Maybe the user's phone has been off for a month and they just switched it on. If that happens, Google will give you a little bit of help to fix that. They'll say, hey, here's an intent. You can start an activity, uh, and maybe the user will be able to fix the problem that we're facing that way. But once they do that, it comes back into your activity, and you have to figure out you know, what state were you in in resolving an error, and maybe you fixed one error, but there's another error that Google's telling you there's a way to fix. It's a mess. Has anyone actually implemented uh, the Google API client in their apps at all? A couple of people. So if you have, and you don't have about 150 lines of code just to initiate that connection, you're probably doing it wrong. I know I was doing it wrong, too. This is the auto-managed connection. This is all you need. Uh, you know, there's still some there, but it, let's walk through it. It's actually pretty simple. So first of all, we need to subclass the right thing to use the auto-managed connection. The right thing is a v4 fragment activity. Now you'll see there, that's not a v4 fragment activity. Luckily for us, the app compat activity does inherit down the chain from the v4 fragment activity. So we can use that. That's part of the Android support library, uh, Android support library v7 app compat package. And if you're starting a new app, you're probably going to want to use that anyway. So it's convenient for us. 
And we also need this ion connection failed listener. Uh, now, I mentioned that we don't really have to deal with handling the error resolution state when using the auto-managed connection, but we could actually get to a point where Google says, hey, we've tried everything that we can try. This just isn't going to work out. At this point, you probably want to give the user a message, maybe log something to your server, but at this point, you know that Google has tried to resolve all of the errors it possibly can. We need this Google API client. This is what we're talking about. This is our connection. So we have a, a instance of it in our class. And to actually build this API client, we use this builder pattern. This is another thing you're going to see very commonly in Google Play services. I don't know if it's because of you know, the Javaisms of the library so much or the, the style of, that the engineers code in, uh, but this is a very common pattern. So we create our builder, we pass it our context, and we're going to add the APIs that we need. We can add multiple APIs if we need to, but in this case, we're only dealing with location services. Finally, that ma magical enable auto manage call happens, and we need to bri provide it a couple of things. One of them is the fragment activity, like I said, the v4 fragment activity. That happens to be this, because we've implemented it. The other is this interface that we also implemented. So these are the two things we need to pass in to make this happen. And then Google will handle the rest for us. We just need to call build and start using it. So let's jump into a little bit of a code demo here. We're going to actually show you how to implement the Fuse Location Provider, since we were talking about it. I've got a, a pretty simple solution set up here. It's uh, just one activity, and I've already implemented the Google API client setup in it. So I've got you know, my app compat activity, I've got my connection failed listener, I'm creating my builder here. Uh, the, the view of this activity just has one text box. We're just going to log some information to that text box about location. And finally, I'm calling my build method here to get my actual Google API client. And now I'm ready to go, right? Well, I left out one minor detail. When we call build, our API client is created, but it's created in a state that is connecting. It might not be connected by this point. It's really fast to connect. It doesn't take very long, but the next line of code, it might not quite be connected. So we could pull the state of it. We could say, hey, Google API client, are you connected? Might be, might not be. A nicer way to do that, and this is going to be a little bit of a theme today, is we're improving these APIs for you as we create bindings for them, as we see some pain points. And one of the places we're trying to start to stick things is in this extensions namespace. So this is coming. This isn't quite released yet. We didn't quite push the button before I came up here. Uh, but this is coming in the next release, 29.0.0.2 uh, it should be. And that namespace will start to grow and have more interesting things for us developers. So if we start using that namespace, we can instead come down to this builder and say, instead of build, let's do build and connect async. We're .NET developers, right? So we've got this method here, and this conveniently returns a task for us, a task of type Google API client. That's great. And by the name of the method, I'm going to hope that it connects for us as well. So we can simply await that method call, and now we've got this Google API client ready to go. Now we can actually start getting location information. So I can start by creating a location request. I mentioned that we need to tell Google Play Services what kind of location information we're looking for, and so it can choose the appropriate providers to fulfill that request. So I can say ver location request equals new location request. That's pretty straightforward. And now this location request is in one of those builder patterns as well. So we have a number of options we can use with the, this location request. We can set the expiration. Maybe we only want to receive location updates for a limited amount of time. We can set the interval. So how fast do we want to receive updates? Let's say every second or so. We can set the smallest displacement. So how you know, small of moves in that location value do we want to be able to detect? How, how much uh, accuracy do we want to have updates for? But the important thing to set here is this location request dot priority. And there's, I mentioned a few different types of priorities. We have a balance power. This is that one that gives you a really good balance of like 0.6% per hour battery drain, 40 meters accuracy, and it might take about 20 seconds from a cold startup to give you a fix. Uh, however, I mentioned that that information is shared, right? So if other apps are already lo accessing location, 
that's probably not going to be the amount of time it takes. It should be much quicker. For the demo, let's do high accuracy. Let's just drain that battery as fast as we can. So we've got our location request created. Now we're ready to actually ask for location updates. So we can say location services. And we're going to use this fused location API. Scroll up a bit so you can see that. And now we want to request location updates. And let's just look at the signature of that method for a second. So we can re request location updates. We need to pass it the Google API client. Uh, we need to pass our location request. And then we need to pass this iLocation listener. We'll get that to that in a second. I think what's more interesting is this pending result that it's going to return. So a pending result from Google's uh, Google Play Services library is kind of like a task. It's a future. It's a promise. But it's their own version of it. I'm just going to fill out the rest of this request quick. Let's zoom back out. And we're going to pass it this. And we'll fill that in in a second. So we've got that pending result. Now, we could simply say you know, dot await. But that await call is actually not a C sharp await. This is a Java method that's going to block. So we don't really want that. We could set a callback, um, which takes a interface. That's the default way that Java does it. And that doesn't work so well for us in C sharp. We already have some helper methods. So we could really pass an action in instead. We could do that. Uh, but like I said, we're C sharp developers. We can do better. Let's check out the request location updates async instead. Just zoom in on that method signature this time. So this one gives us a task of type statuses. So status is the result that we'll get back from that method call. And of course, it's a task. We can await it. That's really useful. So I'm just going to set my await here. Now, I mentioned that iLocation listener interface. Let's go and implement that. I've already got that mostly done here. I'm just going to uncomment it out. And this on location changed method is really simple. That the interface just has that one method. We get a location parameter. Uh, and so we're going to use some C sharp 6 magic to actually write that out to our text view. Nothing magical going on there. So now that we've got our request fulfilled, the last thing that we might want to do is see if we can get some information a little bit quicker. Because you know, I said it could take 20 seconds or so. It's probably not going to be that bad. But luckily for us, Google actually stores the last location for us uh, from any of the apps that have used location recently. So we can just request location services, fuse location API, and get last location. Oh, now, just like everything else here, I have to pass a Google API client in. Again, that pattern is very common. And now I'll have access to my last location. So we could actually check that last location. We could check the time on it to see if it's recent, if we actually want to consider that useful. You know, if it's three days ago, well, it's probably not that useful. Um, but we're going to, for the demo, just call the on location change method we already have and pass that location into it. Now, I probably want to, would want to be a good citizen and unwire that location listener once I'm done with it. So we, we probably want to do that either in our on stop or on destroy. You have to pick the right life cycle of your activity to do this all in, of course. But I'm not going to do that right now. I'm not going to wait for this to compile. I'm going to show you the finished result actually running. You'll just have to take my word for it. Oh, sneak peek. So I'm going to run this app. And all it's going to do is start spitting out location updates for me. So I ask for them every second or so. Maybe it's not quite able to keep up with it. I'm, I'm not sure how it's doing with location inside. But there you go. That's all you need to do location services in your app. And you know there wasn't much code to it. All right, let's, let's dive back into a little bit more content. So I mentioned that you know, we're .NET developers, right? We deserve good things. And that's something that we're working really hard at trying to bring you. So you saw the pending result. Uh, that's now awaitable. The pending result actually itself is awaitable. However, we have wrapped all of those methods that return that pending result into methods with an async suffix that actually returns the correct type of result as well, instead of just a Java language object that you'd have to figure out how to cast. We have a lot of data buffer classes in Google Play Services. This is another common pattern. We didn't see any examples of this, but a lot of different classes subclass data buffer. Now, 
by default, they just give you a Java language object. Uh, you have to call .get on every index that you want. We've implemented ienumerable of type t for you here. This stuff is all available already. One of the features that is coming soon in the next release as well is support for this Google Services JSON file. So Google has this website you can go to and you can configure the different services that you want to include in your app. Uh, it's really easy to use. You pick like app invites, app indexing, Google Cloud Messaging. You can give it a, uh, it'll load your, your projects from your Google Developer Console for you, or you can have it create a new one for you. And it's gonna go ahead and set up all of the API keys and everything you need, enable all the correct APIs for you, and at the end of it, it's gonna give you this file. In Android, for a while now, you've been able to stick this file into your project and tell your Gradle build script to say, hey, here's my config file, put the right stuff in the right place in my app for me, I don't wanna have to think about it. So now we're doing the same thing with Visual Studio and Xamarin Studio as well. You'll be able to import your file in the, in the next version in your, into your project, set the build action to Google Services JSON, and it's gonna do the same thing for you, put all the stuff in the right places. So we're really trying to make things better for .NET developers in our bindings for these, these Google Play Services libraries and all the other stuff too, like Android support. Next, I wanna talk about app invites. App invites solve a really interesting problem. Let's say that I am listening to music in an app that I like and I want to share that with my friend. How do I do that right now? Well, maybe I send them a text message and say, hey, check out this song, or I send them an email, hey, check out this song. Um, and then they have to go actually open an app, get an app maybe, look for an app that has the song I'm talking about, maybe their service doesn't. There's got to be a better way, right? Well, there is. So in our app, we can actually add a button or something on the page that we're on currently. Let's say we're listening to a song and the user clicks, okay, I wanna share this song. This wonderful dialogue pops up for us. We didn't have to make this, this is Google's doing. They have made something that looks quite well, I think. The user has an opportunity to customize the message that you pre-populated. Uh, you can pick all the different contacts you wanna share it with. And eventually when you hit the send button, all of their friends are gonna receive nice invitations. So once they receive their invitation, they click on the install button if they don't already have that app, and they're taken to the app store. They go install the app, and the app is actually open once you install the app uh, and it's on your device ready to go. Once that app is open though, they go one step farther and they actually broadcast a deep link to the content that you originally shared from your app. Your app has an opportunity to process that deep link and take them right to the song that you were listening to that you wanted to share with them. So this is a great way to organically grow your app's traffic, right? Having your users share things with their friends usually is a good way to generate some good traffic in your apps. All right, did anyone download the app before when I came, they came in? A few Android users, open it up, please. I'm going to open my app here too. It's an app called Nearby Monkey and you can toggle the different settings, it's just kinda silly. Um, I can already see a few users. I'm gonna open up the camera here. So you guys all had the Android version, and last night some, some people on our team stayed up quite late helping us make this cool uh, iOS version as well. So we can see all these different monkeys that you've configured, all the different happiness levels and you know, information, and you're doing it on Android devices. This is an iOS device, of course, and what's even better is we didn't actually have to do anything. We didn't have to pair our apps, we didn't have to give each other our email addresses or our phone numbers or anything like that. Oh, my, you're stuck watching me from two angles, sorry. But this app is all done with Google Play services. Um, gonna launch my Android one here. So if you don't have the app installed, or maybe you can show one of your, your neighbors if they don't have it installed. You can see here I'm starting to see on Android all the different things and people can change their statuses. This is all done with the Google uh, Play services nearby messages API. Really simple to use, really powerful, because we didn't have to, of course, connect anything. It's using a bunch of stuff to do this. Now let me just jump back into the slideshow. It's using uh, things like GPS. It's using things like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and it's also using audio. You may have seen it prompt you to use, uh, for permission to use your microphone, right? So it's, it's figuring out what devices are located nearby, cross-platform, and talking to Google servers and then sharing these messages. So I use the Messages API for this app, and that's one of the easy ones to use. You can subscribe to a certain topic, you can unsubscribe from the topic, uh, you can publish messages, and you can unpublish messages. 
There's also this connections API. So if you want to do something a little bit more detailed in a session, like play a game with people nearby, you can use the connections API. It lets you discover other sessions, advertise your own sessions, uh, send invites and accept invites. And once you've connected in a session, you can actually send and receive messages over just that one session uh, you know, instead of everyone around you. So this is great for something like a game, and it works, again, cross-platform. I want to talk about app indexing next. So I mentioned that a couple of times, and app indexing solves a really interesting problem. In fact, you saw a little preview of an implementation of app indexing this morning in Xamarin Forms app. The Android side of that is driven all by app indexing, and this is what app, how app indexing actually works. Another common problem we have as users, well, I go search for something on my phone, on Google, I want to search for a baboon, and I find the search result that I like, I click it, and then I go to the website, and then I find the information I want, but all along, there is a really good app for that same content that that maker of that website published, and maybe I even had it on my phone, but I didn't bother opening it because the information I was looking for was not something I wanted to go dig through the app for. I wanted to search through Google. So we want to eliminate that step because we have these awesome apps that we want our users to use. We don't want them to have to settle for a web page, right? This is, this is 2016, I think, right? We could do better. So let's look at a little demo of this. Now, this monkeys app is something that James Montemagno threw together, and I went to go create something just like it, but I realized that, well, he already made this, so I'm going to demo it because it's pretty awesome. So I have an emulator here that's just showing the, this, the old usual way that we would do things. So if I might want to search for monkeys app, because I know monkeys app is a very reliable source of monkey information, so I'm already going to start using them. And I want to search for a baboon. Well. I can search Google for it. Yeah, that's fine. OK. And you know, there's, some, there's some search results there. Um, so I'm going to click on the one that goes to the app, or it's, that goes to the website. And you know, that's an OK experience. I, I figured out that you know, they're from wherever. You know, their population is a certain amount. But all along that same time, we actually have this really great app that looks a lot better that we want to use instead. So look at all these monkeys you know, laid out nicely. It's much more performant. It's smooth. I can go see the baboons page. It looks much more beautiful. Like, look at that. Look at that action right there. It's wonderful. Why settle for less as a developer and as a user, too? So instead of doing it the old way, let's try with the monkeys app installed. Let's do monkeys app baboon. And, OK, I'm going to go to the web link right from here. Oh, wait, went to the web page. Don't want to do that. So let's start searching again. Let's search for baboon. Look at this. Right in our search results here, we have a link, a deep link, right into our app. If I click on it, hopefully it actually takes me there. And we go diving right into that deep link content for exactly what we are looking for, and that goes right from Google Search. Now, we should also be able to search uh, monkeys app baboon. Let's search Google for it. Again, I think I spelt it wrong last time. But you can see here this looks a little different. All of a sudden, we have this icon in our search results, and it says monkeys app app. Well, it's because it's kind of a funny name for an app, but it's installed already, right? So if I click on that instead, again, it takes me right into the app content that I'm looking for. So this is deep linking right into our apps from Google. If you have content that's already available in an app and on a website, you're going to want to send users to the app, if at all possible. This allows us to do that. So App Links is pretty powerful as well. And as I mentioned, this is already part of Xamarin Forms now in the, in the stuff that we released today. All right, so I talked a lot about Google Play services on Android. We demoed it. We saw some cool stuff. I talked a little bit about the nearby messaging API on iOS, but there's actually a lot more stuff that we can do with Google services on iOS as well. We actually have ads, analytics, app indexing, app invites. So those two things that I just demoed, you can do that for iOS as well. So you're going to want to take advantage of that on those platforms too, if that's a platform that you're targeting. Uh, we have nearby API coming. Uh, obviously, we stayed up very late last night writing that, so that's on its way. 
And so I'd encourage you to check out not just Android, but Google as well. All right, so your app needs more Google Play services. Have I convinced you? Do you guys agree? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, if anyone has some questions, I'll uh, hang around for a bit. But uh, thanks for coming out, everyone. Appreciate it.